Was a South Florida dentist the mastermind behind a murder for hire plot? Chrissy, the state alleges the brother hired two hitmen to kill FSU professor Dan Markell so that his sister, along with their children, could relocate to South Florida where her family lives. Japan M&A market and how does that impact the dental market over here? The economy of Japan, for the last couple decades now, they've been actually shrinking. There is no M&A market for small businesses, even medium businesses. Which department is the hardest department to scale? Clinical? I think that's really hard to scale. HR? Legal standpoint? Clinical ops is very difficult to scale because the complexity is high. The hardest things are tracking the money, managing clinical recruiting and attracting new customers. Welcome back to another episode of Dental Rift. I'm your co-host, Gary Bird. I'm the founder of SMC National, where we help you create, convert, and close more new patients so you can grow the way that you want. My name is Tanner Applegate. I am the CEO and founder of Unified Dental. We are a data platform centralizing all the different tools and data created by those tools into one single place. So we got some awesome topics today. Number one, Japan M&A market and how does that impact the dental market over here and what's going on in the United States? Number two, which department is the hardest department to scale inside of your group practice or DSO? And then thirdly, was a South Florida dentist the mastermind behind a murder for hire plot? So Tanner, which one of these do you want to tackle first? Well, I feel like with murder for hire, man, that's always fascinating, but we can't go there first. Let's do uh, Japan and then we'll go to murder for hire. Okay, cool. So Japan. So tell me what's going on in Japan's M&A market and why we should care over here. Yeah, it's it's so it's a fascinating story. I mean, it's not something that's obviously going to have a huge impact on any dental office here in the States, but it's a fascinating story <laughs> that I want to kind of pull a parallel to in the dental industry and just kind of get your thoughts on. So if we think about the economy of Japan, um, for the last couple decades now, they've been actually shrinking, right? They are not having enough babies every year to repopulate their, I mean, to, to increase their population. And so because of that, they've actually been shrinking. And a lot of the biggest population now is becoming geriatric, 70, 80 year olds that are needing to retire and or close down their business. Okay. So a lot of those business owners now do not have a path forward of what to do with their current business. In the U.S., what would you do if you had a business and you wanted to retire, Gary? If I had a business and I wanted to retire, I would either yeah. sell it or take money out against it. Right. So you sell it or you take money out against it. Even taking money out against it is a little bit of a risk. But in the States, right, if you have a business, you want to get rid of it, you sell it. In Japan, that's not culture. There is no M&A market mm. for small businesses, even medium businesses. What happens is the the historically what you do with a business in Japan is you hand it down to your next generation, right? You hand it down to your kids or you hand it off to some senior uh, person within the company that's been helping you operate these things for a long time. Well, there's a problem here, right? If you don't have kids, you have nobody to hand the business down to. And if your population is aging and your second in command is also wanting to retire, you can't give it off to them. And so this creating this unique problem in Japan where they cannot sell or get rid of these businesses. And so they're having to like develop this culture from something that has never existed of selling these small to medium sized businesses. And so what's been fascinating though, is how they solve this problem, right? They can't like, there's not a huge market of out there buyers. There's not like the broker systems like we have here. There's not these um, websites where you can go and list your business, et cetera. So what they've done is they have turned to AI to solve this. Right. So you mm. get all of these different inputs of the business. You get all these inputs of what a buyer is looking to buy. And AI has gone through and algorithmically started matching buyers and sellers in a way that you couldn't have done without it. And so to me, I just found this fascinating. Right. And I was curious. I mean, I, I have some ideas, but I'm curious, kind of like, as you think about that in the M&A market, how could this translate, if at all, to the dental M&A market? Hey, sorry to interrupt the show, but I got a segment that's going to bring a lot of value to you. People have been sending in their questions to us, and we want to answer them live on the podcast for you. And today's question comes from Dr. Michael. Dr. Michael asks, should I cut my budget in the year because of Thanksgiving and Christmas? And this is a really good question. And I'll be honest with you, most doctors do cut their budget at the end of the year. So this gives you a huge advantage because doctors who are cutting their budget at the end of the year don't realize that there's other doctors that are a little bit more savvy when it comes to marketing or 
actually keeping their budget or ramping it up. But what they do is they squeeze it into a three week period. So from November 1st to right before Thanksgiving, they're cramming their full month's budget and they're putting it in that three week period. Same thing in December. And what that does is it creates a ton of new opportunities because you aren't competing against as many people. So my recommendation is to maintain your budget, just squeeze it and you'll get a lot more opportunities because of that. If you want to get your questions answered, send them in to askgary at smcnational.com. Now back to the show. Yeah, I Here's think the, yeah, the one thing that I've noticed about the M&A market here in the States about um, around dentistry is that the money's starting to get smarter, right? Like they're starting to learn about dental where before it was just like, you're a dentist? Oh, okay, cool. Like there was no, no not a lot of uh, uh, data behind what kind of dentist you were, what kind of treatment were you doing? Uh, there was huge black holes inside of that, but now you're starting to see people figure out like, oh, there's a huge difference between like a full arch dentist and a GP dentist and a pediatric dentist. And what are the pros and cons and what do we need to be careful of? So as that continues to develop, I think that people are going to get a lot smarter of what kind of dental practices you should be investing in and which ones you should stay away from. There's going to be dental offices that are not as um, friendly to you uh, during economic downturns. And there's going to be ones that are more, have more explosive upside during economic good times. And when interest rates are low and things like that, all of that is just starting. I feel like just starting to uh, really come to fruition and AI, I think could really speed that along. I could also see the AI leveling the playing field for uh, smaller groups, right? So if you're a smaller group and you have five locations and you want to buy a six, you don't have the resources that somebody who has 500 practices and they're buying their 501st practice, right? So AI can really set the, the level, the playing field for you to be able to plug some things in and be able to ask questions that the group of 500 would be able to ask. Now the group of five will be able to ask that if you, you have to know what to ask. AI to be able to do that. But imagine if there was just a, a calculator that could tell you what the value of your practice is via AI, just by plugging in information and then also tell you where your weaknesses and strengths were. That would be really cool and something that everybody would use. Yeah, I think that. So what I'm hearing from you is that it could definitely be beneficial in the due diligence, right? Making sure that you're getting all the information that you need to make sure that the purchase is good. I think that one of the aspects that I thought of immediately was from a seller's perspective, there's a lot of dentists that feel this urgency to connect with a DSO, right? Like, hey, this DSO wave is coming. If I sell now, I'll be able to get more from my practice than if I sell in 20 years from now, et cetera. But then there's this daunting aspect of like, how do I even begin to start dating DSOs, right? And a lot of the times the brokers are biased too, because they know if I go and just take you to this DSO, they'll get the deal done quicker, they'll pay me faster, and I don't have to deal with selling you for years at a time, right? And But that's not always what's best, right? Somebody that pays the highest price does not always be the one that allows you clinical autonomy post-sell, or they may not be able to allow you to continue to mentor the way you want, or maybe you have to do operational changes that you'd want. And I think that from a seller's perspective, matching this to AI, where you'd say, hey, from a buyer, here's our list of things that are non-negotiables that you have to do. And then from a seller being able to say, hey, here are the things that are important to me on who I sell to right? P price is something that will always be up there for people, but it's not always necessarily like, I'm not willing to risk my personal life satisfaction post sale just to make a few extra bucks on the sale, right? And so being able to go in and rank these things and then being able to have it sort of act like algorithmically match me to who my best deal would, I think that from a seller's perspective, that's a no brainer, right? Yeah, and then as you that. said, sometimes these smaller DSOs that actually are better cultural fits for a lot of these dentists, they don't have the marketing budgets to even get included in the due diligence process that yeah. somebody needs to buy. So yep. yeah, I think that there's a huge opportunity there to make it for a level playing field to actually find what's best for the buyer and seller. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, the franchise market for like restaurants and other kinds of fran franchises. Like you can just go to a website now and go, here's all, you're all in. This is going to be for your building, your build out, your, your, to get the store off the ground, your marketing, your operation expense, your recurring expenses. This is what you're going to be looking at. And then here's what your revenue is going to be projected from that. Like that's all out there because everything's been created already. For dental, it's much more foggy. 
um, still because that's still being all worked out. But I, I think that's the future is that you can go to a website and be able to pull your dental practice and what, what it's going to cost to add another practice and what your all in is going to be and what your outcomes are going to be. Obviously it's not going to be as straightforward as a franchise because those are very, very templated, but you can, I think you could get, get uh, close to that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I just thought that the, that parallel was very interesting and I would love to see that in dental. I don't, I think that we're a ways off just because there is a lot of money that goes through these broker systems that I don't see that ever going away anytime soon. But um, yeah, so let's, let's, I want to, I'm curious about this uh, dentist that <laughs> is in trouble. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to share this with you. Here we go. Now to a developing story out of Tallahassee with some South Florida ties. That's where the ex-wife of a murdered Florida State professor is testifying in the trial of her brother who is accused of arranging a hit. Janice is in the newsroom with the developing story. Well, Christy, the state alleges the brother hired two hitmen to kill FSU professor Dan Markell so that his sister, along with their children, could relocate to South Florida where her family lives. Day two in the trial of a South Florida dentist accused of being the mastermind behind a murder for hire plot that left an FSU professor dead. Charlie Adelson looking on as his sister Wendy Adelson took the stand once again. But testimony focused on Wendy's ex boyfriend Jeffrey Lacoste, Lacoste with a shocking admission. That Charlie had investigated all possible options to take care of the problem of Danny Markell, including hiring a hitman, which would cost about $15,000. And I later revised that and thought maybe it was $50,000, but the dollar amount was the only thing in question. She definitely said that Charles Idelson had looked into hiring a hitman to kill Danny Markell. Charlie is accused of hiring two hitmen to kill his ex-brother-in-law, Dan Markell. The story unfolded like a movie script. Back in 2014, Markell was shot to death in his driveway by two now-convicted hitmen. Sigfredo Garcia, who is serving a life sentence, and Luis Rivera, who is serving 19 years for his role in the murder. Prosecutors have long alleged that members of the Adelson family were behind the plot because of a bitter child custody battle between Wendy and Markel. Wendy has not been charged with the murder. Wendy, then back on the stand, denying the conversation ever took place. Did you say that Charlie, your brother, this defendant, had explored all options to resolve the problem, including hiring a hitman, and it would cost either fifteen or fifty thousand dollars. No. But Lacoste says at one point Wendy tried to frame him for the murder. You believe that Wendy Adelson tried to frame you for Professor Markell's murder, right? I'm suspicious that there was an effort made in that that way, yes. And Charlie Adelson's ex-girlfriend, who was convicted in playing a role in the murder for hire plot, is expected to take the stand at some point during the trial. Okay, Janice. Th well, really, this should be a new segment for our show. Really smart people <laughs> doing really stupid stuff. I was just sitting there thinking that we need to create this segment and make it called Dentists Are Crazy. <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't like some of the smartest people I know are dentists, right? Like when I talk to them, I'm like, wow, you're really smart. But then you, I've seen it. And you've seen this with doctors as well. Like th there's stuff that goes on and this is, you could do this with any profession, I'm sure. But this is absolutely wild that you would think that you could get away for, with something like this and go and hire a hitman for, for what? Like, why do these people think that they can get away with this? Maybe people are getting away with it. We have no idea. <laughs> That's a wild. And, That's I mean, a wild we, point. We, we, uh, we hear the people that get caught. How many people aren't getting caught? And the reality, I have no idea. We live in a crazy world. Uh, I want to talk about, um, do you have any other thoughts on that before we move to the next one? Because I want to talk about scaling uh, the easiest, hardest departments to scale inside a dental no, office. Not, let's shut through that. So you had a question. What is the easiest or hardest? What no, is the what hardest? Is, to me, I'm curious. There are probably about six to eight departments, depending on how big you are as a DSO, that you have to figure out the logistics for of how to scale as you start adding on new locations. Right. And so I was just kind of thinking to myself, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this. What are the hardest departments inside of a DSO to scale? Right. So, okay, so, so let's think about departments. So let's work through let's the departments. Through. Yeah. Accounting, revenue cycle management, clinical operations, including the dentists, hygienists, assistants, et cetera. So we put out financial, uh, we'll just put that under financial and then right. clinical, HR. HR, 
uh, operations, like patient flow upfront kind of stuff. And then uh, marketing, marketing. And I'm trying to think through, oh, IT. like IT uh, facilities, procurement. Yeah, that's, okay, procurement those, that's and probably pretty facilities. good. Okay, so we'll put procurement and facilities under one. So you got finance, you have clinical, HR, ops, marketing, IT, and then procurement and finance. So um, finance, uh, let's go each through each of those. So finance, like a P&L, those kind of things, easy, but revenue cycle management, hard. That's hard to scale um, and get right, especially when you're working with a bunch of insurance. So I'll put that on, on the short list of hard. Clinical. I think that's really hard to scale. Consistency. How, how do I get one dentist who thinks one way to, and get all my to get all my other dentists to think that way? Um, so that's a hard one. HR, from a legal standpoint, I don't think it's hard to scale the legal side of HR. The recruiting side, it's definitely hard. And then, oh, you. I don't know if we forgot a category like M and A. Uh, that's its own. Yeah, biz dev. Yeah, biz dev. Okay, so we'll add that biz dev. Is dev. Okay. Um, ops. I feel that that's probably not as hard to scale. I wouldn't put that as harder than the first three that we listed. Would you agree with that? Keep going. Okay. Marketing. I'll, I'll give my thoughts afterwards. Okay. Marketing. I don't think okay. that one is, is, is hard to scale. I think there's, I think it can be hard to get off the ground, but once you figure it out, you can, you rinse, repeat. There's, there's difficulties in it. Um, IT. Um, I think there's a lot of high risk with this one. There can be a lot of high risk, but um, you can definitely scale it. And then procurement and facilities. I feel like you could scale that one. And then biz dev would be hard. So I would say the, the, the four hardest ones are finance, specifically revenue cycle management, clinical, a, uh, recruiting, and then acquisitions, or, or if you're launching de novos. So did I get... The top four, do you think those are, am I in the right family? I, I would agree with you on most of those. I think that to me, what makes a department harder to scale is A, how many different tasks are they doing? And then B, um, what is the level of skill set required for those tasks, mm -hmm. right? And then also how many humans are usually involved? The more humans there are, the more change management there is, and the more change management, the complexity goes up. And so so, I think so that just in, to reiterate that, so it's the, how hard is the skill? Like can, does one person only know this information in your company and then there's only 10 others that can do it? That makes it really hard to scale because it's hard to get people that understand it or how and the opposite end of the spectrum, how many people you have to pump it through. The more right, people you have quantity. to pump it through. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, would so ops fall under that then? Because ops is like so, everybody in the practice. Ops, no. Well, I, I think that of ops, let's say front office ops and let's say back office ops, clinical being its own type of ops, which is different than like the front office. I think if you strip RCM out of it, the complexity of the front office really becomes a lot lower. Yeah. Right? The skill set isn't super high, but there are a lot of nuances involved that can be difficult. But yes, ultimately, I don't think that one's too hard to scale. Um Clinical ops is very difficult to scale because the complexity is high. But the reality is, too, is that because it requires a degree, a lot of the times the base level is something that you can hire in because the skill set is required. You have to have a degree or something. Right. And so I think to go in and optimize it, it's very high. But to create a base level where a lot of people actually end up sitting, is just like, we're going to hire you if you've got a degree and we'll just kind of sit there. That one's relatively easy and you can get away with it, right? High, and and most groups do. And and, and, right? and and people who are non-clinicians like us, you know what I mean? You're an ops guy. I'm a marketing guy. We're just going to be like, okay, if, <laughs> if you say that's right, right? right? Like we people can question marketing. Is. People can question, anybody can question marketing and ops. Anybody in the whole company can go, wait a second. That doesn't look right with operations or that doesn't look right with marketing. But when it comes to clinical, everybody kind of shrugs their shoulders unless they're a dentist or maybe a hygienist or dental assistant, but everybody else is just kind of like, yeah, if you say so. Yeah, that's true. And that's, I think that's also a hard thing then for uh, compliance issues, right? I think that to get an optimized clinician, clinical department 
going well is actually one of the biggest values of a DSO. I just don't know very many DSOs that do it because the change management of changing a doctor is a very difficult thing. Um, on the RCM, there's a lot of complexity involved in it. There's a lot of people involved in it. And so I would agree that that's one of the higher ones. Marketing, there's a lot of different skill sets that are required that you either have to bring those skill sets internal or you have to be able to do vendor management external. And that's very difficult to do at scale as well because a lot of the times um, vendors, like even you admit, Gary, you're like, we're not a branding agency. Like we have some of the skill sets internally, but like we don't excel at that, right? And yep. so to go in and have it be something that you've optimized across all of the functions of marketing is a very difficult thing to scale. Mm. Um, and then accounting, yes, I think that's pretty straightforward. IT is pretty straightforward. They have like high risk on both of those, but they're pretty straightforward. So yeah, I would say kind of RCM, clinical and marketing would be the ones that I would pick. What about uh, biz dev uh, acquisition of new offices and things like that? Does that just get easier to scale if you throw money at it once you have a system? Okay. So, so then if I hear you correctly, the hardest things are tracking the money, uh, managing clinical, like doing the actual thing that you're set out to do, the clinical mm -hmm. side of it, recruiting and attracting new customers. Those are the four hardest to scale. Yep. They're cool. all pretty important too. Yeah. Those are, those are, that's how you grow, right? Those are the backbone of growing, tracking the growing, uh, uh, having the people there to do the growing, um, telling them how to do the growing, like how to, how to uh, clinically, what's our baselines of what's acceptable and then getting the new patients actually there. So awesome, man. This is a really good episode. Awesome. Cool. Have a good one. Appreciate it. All right. Chat soon.